Aloha and welcome to Pioneering Charter Schools. My name is Gene Zaro. I am a founder and a board member of the Kihei Charter School on Maui. And I am here today with some special guests who will uh, talk about charter schools nationally and locally. So uh, right here to my left, I'd like to introduce a former state senator from Minnesota, em Ember Reich Scott. Young. Well, thank you for being here well, and uh, appreciate everything you've done so far for charter schools. Uh, I'm going to take a second, though, and uh, to Ember's left is Taffy Wise, uh, yeah. charter school uh, operator, uh, Kanu Oka'aina on the Big Island. And, of course, we have Charlene Ho, charter school operator on Oahu, uh, Hakipu'u. Aloha. Aloha. So, Ember. Welcome to Hawaii. Mahalo, Jean. Thank you so much. I am honored to be here. I have seen your beautiful state now for a day, and it's gorgeous, and I couldn't be more delighted. Thank you for this honor. The weather's kind of nice. Beautiful. And when you're from Minnesota, you <laughs> notice that. Say, I want to get right to it. You know, um, you're, you're a historic figure in the <laughs> charter school movement. Um, you wrote the original charter school law and that came out of Minnesota. Everyone who, uh, who has charter schools knows this, but we didn't know it was you. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what the heck inspired you to go forward with this educational reform movement and who helped you along the way? Well, first of all, thank you. And it is the 25th anniversary of chartering in this country. So it was June 4th, 1991, when the first law was passed in Minnesota wow. and around the nation. And Hawaii did, did follow pretty soon after that. And I am here to celebrate your 34 charter public schools here. And I'm very delighted about that. Now, what happened 25 years ago is that we wanted to find new opportunities for our families in Minnesota. And at that time, we had something called open enrollment, where you could have a public school student attend any school in the state. So we had more access to choices at that time. But the question arose, what if all the choices were the same? What if they weren't in my neighborhood, or in the case of Hawaii, on my island? What if my child had a different need? And so we looked at what we could do with chartering. Chartering provides more opportunities for children and families. What's a charter school? Well, it's an independent, autonomous charter school public school. That's really important. No tuition is charged. Are you sure about that? Absolutely. Everyone seems to think public, you know, charter schools cost money. Because, you know, believe it or not, one third of America thinks that charter schools are private schools. But they're not. They're public schools, just like the DOE schools or the district schools on the mainland. And these schools are an opportunity for you and me, parents and teachers, to come together and find new ways of learning and introduce them, new and innovative ways of learning for our children. And that's the opportunity to bring new ways into education. And that's what really motivated us in Minnesota to begin this. It also is a way to empower teachers to do new and different things and to be the professionals that they are. Absolutely. And no one takes on the institution of public education alone. Who were some of your big supporters back then? Did anyone stand out? Were there uh, yes. some people you couldn't do it without? Well, First of all, our governor was helpful in open enrollment. But the second and second visionary here, which might surprise you and your viewers, is the American Federation of Teachers president, Al Shanker. In 1988, he came to Minnesota to an education reform conference, and I heard him speak about something called charter schools. And I was thinking, what is that? And he wanted the opportunity for teachers to be leaders, to be empowered, to be the professionals they were. So he was looking at something called charter schools, and that's where I learned about it. And you know what he said? The reason he wanted them is because the districts could take their customers for granted. And you know, he was right, because 
because there were no other choices around. So a group of citizens in Minnesota, whether they be citizen leaders of education or unions or, or uh, business, all came together to create this idea of charter public schools. And that's how it all happened three years later. Not an easy task, though, I might say. So, okay, 25 years, charter schools. There's probably still some myths out there oh. that are perpetuated. So we know the first biggest myth is that it costs money to go to charter schools. Right. And we are public schools. And, and, you know, here in Hawaii, I think we've all attached the word public to our name because I personally know what started out as Kihei High School became Kihei Public mm -hmm. Charter mm -hmm. High School. Mm -hmm. to get the word public in there, which would be synonymous with non-tuition. What always, other myths mm -hmm. are out there? That I you always say with? charter public schools or district public schools or DOE public schools. So they're all public, and you're absolutely right. That's a myth. But other myths, oh my goodness, they are out there. And believe it or not, Gene, they are the same myths that we dealt with back in 1991 in Minnesota. They're still today. The number <laughs> one myth that we hear, besides private schools, this is it, is that somehow charter schools take money from the district or DOE schools. And we okay. hear that. We you hear have that. that here as well. But it's so just dispel not, that myth. It is just not true because as you well know as a leader of a charter school the money follows the very student it's intended to mm -hmm. educate. Every child deserves an effective education. So in Minnesota for example if a child moves from the Minneapolis district to the St. Paul district money follows the student. If the child moves from the Minneapolis district to a Minneapolis charter public school, the money follows the child. Mm -hmm. Same money and it just follows that child so that child gets the very best education and chance that they deserve. And we, we know this and I'm glad that that is the case. We actually changed our formulation on funding to a weighted, a weighted type student funding mm -hmm. within four or five years ago I think. But um, but the problem is there isn't enough. Well, I was going to get to challenges. You know, it mm -hmm. seems like challenges for charter schools are not unique to Hawaii. That's true. Are, are there other challenges, uh, states out there with challenges? <laughs> well, you've just led to another myth, and that is that somehow charter schools just get a lot of money. But that's not true. And in fact, across the country, charter schools actually live on only on the average 70 percent of the funding of their counterpart DOE schools. Now, in Hawaii, that's even less. That's because you don't get the dollars for your facilities either. So you have one of the lowest percentages of funding as compared to your district schools and that is very very difficult for you to run a charter school so equitable funding is really a priority and some other states including mine in Minnesota have devised other revenue sources for things like facilities to to fill that gap so we're we're facing that um, right now with mm -hmm. uh, last year we were fortunate that the legislature put in to uh, you know, into a bill that they could consider funding some type of facilities for charter schools. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're looking to that right now. But um, Hawaii does seem to have uh, other challenges and other ways of doing business for charter schools. Have you noticed anything about Hawaii charter schools? I know you've been here before, yes. and I know you're the person that does their homework. And I know you've only been here a day today, but how does Hawaii re look in the world of charter schools? Are we different? Are we the same? Do we have strengths? Do we have weaknesses? Well, when I uh, viewed or actually visited four charter schools a year ago on right. the Big Island, I was absolutely impressed. I saw innovation in those schools that I have not seen anywhere else in this country. So I would say that Hawaiian uh, public charter schools are leading on the leading edge of innovation that we can learn from around the country and they can also probably learn from some of the other states as well. So that I think is a huge plus. I've also seen a lot of passion on the charter school leaders and they really are committed to the families and to the students they serve. Now, we do have a couple of policy differences, though, here for the rest of the, the nation. And probably the biggest one is that you have one authorizer or one commission to oversee all of your charter schools. 
nearly every, in fact, every other state in our country has multiple authorizers. They can range from higher education institutions to nonprofit organizations to school districts to state boards, but they have many. And the reason for that is so that the charter schools have a choice of authorizer and they can find an authorizer that will be aligned with their views and values and they can work with that person for that support that they need to succeed. And together they go into partnership to succeed. So the more authorizers you have in Hawaii, the more robust your charter sector will be. And here's the other thing that I love about Hawaii. When I visited those schools, I saw these amazing cultural immersion schools. I saw the Hawaiian focus schools and they were absolutely stellar. I loved seeing how they worked together. So let's say you could have an authorizer that might be overseeing the culturally focused schools, for example. So that might be one way where you could have a new and different authorizer and bring more choice and opportunity to your families. Well, you've made it easy to segue to our guests right here. Uh, Taffy Wise, Kanu Oka'aina, and Charlene Ho again with Haki Pu'u. Hello. Um, talk about innovation, talk about uh, courage. These Hawaiian cultural schools are uh, a hallmark of chartering in yes. Hawaii. And Taffy, you're hearing someone, and Charlene, you're hearing someone talk about a cultural authorizer that mm -hmm. might be something. First, tell us a little bit about your schools, each take a turn, okay. but then tell me what you think about a an authorizer that might have a sensitivity to cultural issues and cultural education as it sits in Hawaii today. Hello, my name is Taffy Wise. I'm one of the founding team of Kanaokaina in the Big Island of Hawaii. We're the first Hawaiian focused charter school, started in 2000, so we're going to be 16 years old this year. Congratulations. We got our first PhD. We're very proud of that. Um, but I think for us, appropriate assessments um, are one key as we try to maintain community control and be transparent and accountable. So we've been working really hard um, so to, to frame appropriately what our cultural assessments will be. And not to disregard the other public assessments that are necessary, but to focus on our vision and mission. Mm -hmm. um, we've often commented that if there were an authorizer that were more aligned with our mission and vision, mm -hmm. it would be easier for them to understand, mm -hmm. and they, we could be more accountable to them. What do you feel about um, multiple authors or authorizers in Hawaii? Would it be more expensive? Uh, would we get as much accountability and transparency if there were multiple authorizers? Well, absolutely. You would actually increase the accountability because okay. you would have um, very specific contracts or charters between your authorizer and your school. And what I love about those charters is that you get to decide together what are the goals for our students and how do we achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. So you, you get the autonomy to get to those goals in a different way as long as you get results. And that's the whole bargain of chartering, which is we kind of trade those regulations for results right. and when you get those results then you can be renewed again by your authorizer and if you're not doing a good job they'll help you improve but if you don't do a good job then you could be closed which is actually more accountability mm -hmm. than in a district or DOE public school so I want the public to understand that we really do hold charter schools accountable and you do work closely with your authorizer and that's why you want an authorizer who believes in what you do and can support you okay Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, Hakipu'u Learning Center has a nice uh, co collaboration with Minnesota yes. from the beginning. Uh, we began our, we opened our doors in 2001 and inspired in part by the, the efforts of Kanuokaina and that community. Um, and there was a whole ripeness within our communities to really answer the call to be able to do startup charters uh, within a, a year two years maybe mm -hmm. at the most, we went from two charters in the state to 25, which was then the cap. Mm -hmm. So clearly the community was ready. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that's part of the promise of the, of the charter movement and the school uh, focus on student <laughs> needs and community and family needs as well. Um, ours is a um, student-centered place and project-based learning environment inspired mm -hmm. by Minnesota New Country Charter School, one of the nationally recognized charter schools as well. 
um, we, we really find that the state accountability system is certainly a system that we need to participate in as a public school, but it doesn't give a holistic look at students. And we're hoping that through multiple authorizers and through our individual collaborations within the charter movement, um, both Hawaiian Focus as well as the other charters, that we would be able to develop more holistic ways of accountability. Do you have some advice around that or some insight? That's one of the wonderful areas of innovation of chartering where we can find different ways for mm -hmm. students to succeed, multiple ways for them to yes. succeed and we can develop those because some children grow at different rates than others and sometimes they start further behind, right? Yes. So what we can do is share best practices. Mm -hmm. Now what you took from Minnesota is a best practice mm -hmm. and you're going to give back some best practices <laughs> to Minnesota and I love that and this is what we call smart chartering and this is where we want to go in the next 25 mm -hmm years is the very thing you did which is to learn from one another and I I'm just think that you folks are real pioneers and you're going to continue to be pioneers we need more chartering in Hawaii uh, I know there's applicants that are interested in doing this and I think that there's that would occur if we had multiple authorizers we'd have more people that could oversee them and help them succeed yes so uh, I have a question um, I, our school is a, uh, a, not a cultural school, so mm -hmm. we just teach what we teach <laughs> in a project-based learning environment. It's great. Which is a great best practice mm -hmm. that chartering yes. has done, project-based mm -hmm. and personalized learning. That is the wave of the future, so with more power to you. With yes. wonderful academies. Yes. Yes. I am uh, uh, concerned that um, our uh, commission, they are doing a yeoman's job but they have 34 charter schools, mm -hmm. and that just seems like a lot of work. Uh, I don't know how you could wrap your arms around 34 different entities. You, even these two academies right here, these two charter schools are different. You mm -hmm. cannot find right. comparisons mm -hmm. right. that will make apples to apples. Plus, in Hawaii, you asked about the differences. Well, one of the differences in Hawaii <laughs> is that your commission has multiple functions that are normally spread out over three or four different groups in other states. So they are filling roles that normally your State Department of Education would fill, your authorizer would fill, your board of directors would fill, and that's just too much for anybody to do, be able to do well. So I'm thinking that if with multiple authorizers, that might help to address that problem. So how does, uh, what, what would a, a standard authorizer look like? How many schools would they have? Um, you know, what is the, uh, the sweet spot for an authorizer in how many schools they could manage well and feel good about what they're doing and help the charter schools you know, mm -hmm. feel good about what they're doing. So I happen to be the board chair of a charter school in Minnesota, and we went to an authorizer that was aligned with our way of thinking. It was called Innovative Quality Schools, because we were innovative. And this authorizer is allowed to do about 20. They have about four to five staff, and they have a cadre of experts they bring in if we have certain needs or problems. But what I like about our authorizer is that when we have a problem, they help us to solve it. So they're not just compliance, of course they hold us accountable, but they help us look at new and different ways to meet the standards and to achieve what needs to be improved, and that's what I love about that partnership with our authorizer. So what would be um, the job duties of an authorizer when you have multiple authorizers. I mean, are there, um, are there duties that we should be focusing on as an authorizer? Like you said, our authorizers do a lot of things that are not normally done right. by authorizers, right? right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know that better than we do because mm -hmm. we've only had experience with one authorizer. Right. Right. But from your experience, what would be the essential tasks of an authorizer that if we had multiple authorizers, this is what they would focus on? Well, in addition to accountability, which is, of course, first and foremost, there would be technical assistance as well. And they would provide that assistance so that they can make sure that their finances are strong and their curriculum is strong. But they would be there to, as, a, as a counselor, if you will, as, as well as someone who is holding them accountable. So it's a partnership. So, Senator, with that said, where does the governing board's role 
come into play versus an authorizer as the mm -hmm. regulator. So here's a contract that you have, their charter between the board, I'm the board chair mm -hmm. and the authorizer, mm -hmm. and you agree on those performance outcomes and that's what you work on together to make the school successful. So Hawaii was, um, we repealed the law in 2012 and charter contracts became a key component for many of us that sat on the task force and I believe all of us here uh -huh. did. Um, it hasn't materialized the way I thought it would because I thought it was going to be a negotiated contract with two mm -hmm. parties that would be unique to Kanaokaina's mission and, mission and community. And it's ended up being a unilateral template um, that actually has no negotiation at all. And that is a difference with the rest of the country. Okay. You see, I like to say, mm -hmm. if you've seen one charter school, you've seen one charter school. Uh, That's yeah. all. That's that cool. means in Minnesota, with 148 charter schools, wow. every charter school contract is different. That's and huge. it's negotiated between me, the board chair, okay. and you, let's say, the authorizer, yeah, to meet our needs, our performance outcomes for what we want to achieve mm -hmm. with our children. So everyone is negotiated separately. That's the autonomy. That's the independence. That's the opportunity for our children that chartering provides. Right. And that's what gives you the flexibility to be innovative yes. and to, to adjust mm -hmm. quickly. And to try those new personalized learning techniques right. or right. to find new ways to involve the children that you might not be able to do in the larger system. You mentioned uh, earlier that often there's multiple entities that are involved in, in the charter uh, movement and, and supporting mm -hmm. charter movement. So one is the authorizer, of course. Mm -hmm. What are those other entities that you think are critical to healthy charters? In the other states, there's often a charter school office. Within the state within system. Within the state system. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where the funding occurs. So the funding goes directly from the state to the charter mm -hmm. school. And it's usually by a formula. So it's not different mm -hmm. between the charters and the, regular. Uh, the regular schools, except for facilities, which we talked about mm -hmm. earlier. That mm -hmm. is a difference. And so um, that's usually there. There's sometimes a charter school office that provides technical support to start charters mm -hmm. so there are some other opportunities as well so, yeah. That's, you guys are great <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't thinking of those questions but um, but Taffy did bring up that um, we rewrote the law about what four years ago mm -hmm. and um, so within that law it was authorized that the State Board of Education could um, you know implement some rules and to go forward with bringing on an additional authorizer. And that's in process right now. Yes. So it's actually just implementing what's already in law. It just took a little while, which I think is fabulous. And so it's really not that new. It's just a process that is now going to occur, and I think that's great. Yeah, and, and I'm hoping you'll take a glance at it while you're here sure. if you haven't read, you know, enough... Uh, you know, legal, legislative uh, work in Minnesota to come here and spend a couple of days relaxing, reading our legal, legislative. <laughs> well, one thing I'd like to <laughs> yes. Yeah, so well, one thing I'd like to add to that for sure, which we haven't discussed, is the fact that in Minnesota and other states, the charter schools actually pay the authorizer three percent of their funds, mm. and that they use to select their authorizer. So, in other right. words, they select from the choices and they say we're going to give you our three percent because we want to work with you. Mm -hmm. That's a little different than what you have here because and, you only have one. Right? And I was going to ask you about right. um, so multiple authorizers right now we have uh, the commission that authorizes all of the charter right. schools and looks at applicants. They and have they a get, lot of power. Your commission you know has more power than any other commission in the in the country. Oh, I don't believe you. They do. They do more, <laughs> more and more powers and authorities and because it's all do. centralized, yeah. And mm -hmm. so, um, but right now the funding, they get some of their funding directly from the state of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So what we would be uh, facing as one of the means of making this work is funding an additional authorizer. Mm -hmm. So you were saying the Initially, a while ago, charter schools were giving up 2% of mm -hmm. their uh, per capita mm -hmm. funding to fund an office, and that office had 
at least three or four evolutions, but that's where the money came from. Uh, and we're just pivoting back to that. And, exactly. And I, and You've do, had that already. And I do think that would probably mm -hmm. be the way to go. But And you're saying that is the practice around the country right now? Every other state does it that way. They fund it through the uh, per capita allocation yes. uh, or however they describe that. Usually about 3% source. and also gives you that choice to pick the authorizer of your, of your vision. Do you think you will be meeting with any of our uh, State Board of Ed people? I think they might benefit by some of your uh, experience. You know, I've learned so much. I've been to 31 states. And what I love about Hawaii is that people are open to hearing about what do other states do. And that's what I bring. You know Hawaii best. So maybe we combine what your traditions and culture are with what I've learned from other states and best practices. And we come out with a better charter sector and we serve better the families of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do. And by the way, by the way, I'm learning a whole lot to share with other states too because you're doing a lot of great things here as well. You don't seem to get too excited about charter schools. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess after I'm 25 have to suck years. You into the chair a little bit here. <laughs> so, if you were to look at our system from the 30,000 foot level, mm -hmm. looking into the fishbowl, yeah. what are the top three things, uh, advice you would have in three points that? that could take us to the next level? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, number one is to have uh, multiple authorizers and to do that as just as quickly as possible. Um, secondly would be to um, really um, spread out those duties. Uh, so it's not just in the authorizers, but in other bodies as well. It helps everybody and it helps the state as well. The state doesn't want to have all that on its uh, plate. Uh, the third thing is just keep that passion going and continue to build those culturally focused schools because that's something I find in Hawaii very special. I came to Hawaii last year on the way back from Guam, mm -hmm. and Guam now has two charter public right. schools. Very similar. They brought them in because they wanted culturally focused mm -hmm. schools, and that's why I'm excited because I think both Guam and Hawaii are leading the way on this whole new area that we can all learn from because we all can use culturally focused yeah. schools in other states too. So if you look at an authorizer and let's say there were three or four, in Hawaii we've talked about the university system. Yes. We've talked about um, private 501c3s. Yes. Um, we've talked about actually counties and municipalities. Yes. Um, and the existing that we have now. How many staffers on average for how many schools and and what it would be the norm. Right now we have, I believe, 17 or 18 staffers in one regulatory mm -hmm. commission. And it's definitely feeling like we're moving back to a DOE type system, which we wanted to give back to the DOE with more innovation and nimbleness. Mm -hmm. And it feels like over these years we're kind of going back to the old model just because that's what we're used to. Mm -hmm. Is that, would you describe multiple authorizers if we had three or four for Hawaii and how many staffers that would? Well, you said the magic words. It gives you more nimbleness and gives you more flexibility. And I want to just say one thing. You mentioned having mm. authorizers in the counties. Yes. And I believe on your islands, each island is a county. Is yeah, that right? Yeah. Well, I just think it would be awesome to have an authorizer per county because that keeps them close close to the people that they serve. Absolutely. So they wouldn't have to come to Oahu in order to get that service and support that they need. As far as staffing, you know, uh, that 3% mm -hmm. per student kind of tells you how much money you have for staffing. Okay. But like the one that serves us, it's about four to five and they serve 20 schools and we feel like we're getting plenty of great service. Wow. So really, it's, be it's because your current commission has many other mm -hmm. functions as well that maybe that's causing the extra staff. And it sounds like in the Minnesota context, you have a strong state office that takes on mm -hmm. certain functions yes. directly with the charters. Mm -hmm. That is right. I think that's they distribute the funding directly, both the federal and the state funding directly, because we are an independent unit. So we could go on forever. <laughs> it feels like, uh, you know, uh, this is just the start of the conversation. But uh, we're running out of time. Uh, last comments, uh, Charlene, we'll go right around. and. Uh, just very, very refreshing, again, to, to share between states and your, your advice around multiple authorizers, um, but also uh, commenting on the passion. I think that's one of the things that we're struggling with right now with the mm -hmm. sort of feeling of a heavy weight. Mm -hmm. um, so mahalo for re-sparking that a bit. Yeah. Yeah.
Jackie. Thank you for validating us and for coming all this way. We really appreciate the guidance. And I think with experts like you that have done it and are doing it, Hawaii can glean a lot. So it's very appreciated. Well, thank you. But all that I want to say is it's you, the three of you, who are the pioneers. You are the ones starting the schools. I hope for the benefit of Hawaiian families there can be more, more opportunities for pioneers like you to make this journey for the kids. Because in the end, I don't think you can have enough opportunities for children. Mm -hmm. They learn differently. Every child learns differently. Yeah. So thank you for what you've done. Well, Charlene, thank you for <clears throat> taking time out of your day. <laughs> Taffy, really appreciate you guys being Thanks, here. Jim. and sharing your experiences and can't thank you enough. Oh, thank you, you know, Gene, I, I know so it's much. hard to pull you out of Minnesota in the winter. <laughs> I know, but, it's a tough you know, duty, you thank know. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, thank you all, folks. Uh, we appreciate your uh, attention to this matter. It's very important to Hawaii's children. Aloha.